And then we looked over at the end of the conversation. I'm, I probably wouldn't cry. I might. What is that? Capitalism is not healthy for children and other living things. Nice. I forgot where I got. I think at Rainbow Bookstore. Oh, okay. Nice. Do you want to talk about student debt now? Yeah, is that our next one? Mm Mm-hmm. Welcome to Marxism Today, the kickoff of Season 3. I'm Red Wagner, as usual, joined by Tony. Hello. (laughs) And this week, our topics are wages for Facebook, student debt, and quote-unquote socially responsible smartphone applications. Enjoy the episode. So student debt. Yep. Is it bit of an issue, although I'm guessing most people who would be listening to this probably are very acutely aware of that fact. Um, I don't know about you. I I won't force you to volunteer any information. I am an odd one out in that I have no student debt. Yeah, I don't have any student debt either. No. no. This might actually be an awful topic, (laughs) seeing as how neither of us have any personal relationship to student debt. Well, not yet, because I am going back to school in the fall. Ah, yeah, okay. However, between Pell Grants and stuff, I actually should have my tuition covered. Um, (laughs) But, I mean, I I don't think that it's... I mean, I think we can still talk about it even without having a personal relationship to it. Because, I mean, that's, I think... The problem is that we are by far the exception to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know plenty of people who have twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars in student debt. Like a, a lot of the people I work with at the library, there are a few people who have, because, uh, I don't know if you know this, but to be a librarian, you need or a master's in library science. Oh, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. There's probably a lot of people out there that want to be librarians. Yeah, Um, and especially in this area with the UW having such a nice library school. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the positions that are, like, librarian positions are super hard to find. Oh, yeah. Especially here. So a lot of them do, like, reference librarian work, and that's part-time work. And these people have a minimum of master's degrees. Some of the people I work with, uh, one lady who is a librarian has her a bachelor's, uh, master's in library science and a law degree. Another lady has, uh, I think she has two bachelor degrees. She has a master's in library science, a master's in social work and is going for an education degree. So a lot of these people just have mountains and mountains of debt. Now, now you mentioned that the, a lot of these folks are working as reference librarians. Yes. But but I don't actually know what that means, and probably a bunch of our listeners don't either. So what what is a reference librarian? And, I mean, not to be, like, super callous about it or anything, but how much do they make? Because that's important when we're talking about student debt how fast you can pay it off, things like that. If if you're not making very much money, then that doesn't allow you to really pay off your loans. Yeah, they the reference librarian is the person who you go up to and you go, hey, I'm looking for this book. I think it's by James somebody or other. Uh-huh. And, and they help it's me find about the this. Yes, that, right? they help you find the book. They also, you know, if you're doing research, they help find all sorts of different things, nice databases. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's who I think of as a librarian. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I I just make the distinction because not being a librarian and working in a library, people don't understand that I am not a librarian. What's your title? I, uh, technically a library assistant. A library assistant. 
Yes. And you like stock shell stock stock the shelves? Nope. No. I check, check people, people out? out. I check your books out for you. Okay. And check them back in is essentially my job. Okay. Um but yeah, and even well, and I I think also just any job like that any wage job, I think you see a lot of people though with all sorts of overly qualified. Like I might be the only one in my department who does not yet have a bachelor's degree. Um Yeah. And everyone the most amount of hours anyone gets is twenty four in my department. So it's all part time work. Um and the jobs pay I think starting pay is about eleven fifty an hour, which isn't terrible. I think maximum that they give you is like seventeen or eighteen if you've been there forever. And that's for the assistant. That's job? for the assistant. For the actual librarians, I believe the or the reference people, I believe they start at about fifteen dollars an hour. But again, they too work no more than twenty four hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. So that's what's really going to kill you. Yeah. And there, they yeah. do get benefits. Most of them. Because if you got 15 bucks an hour and it was a 40-hour work week, then you'd be making $30,000 a year. And, like, that li- gives you, like, like you can be, like, basically middle class at that point. Yeah, if you're a uh, uh, single person, yeah. Yeah. If you're a single Supporting person, Supporting a full family on that can be pretty darn tight. Yeah. But yeah, but if you had like two adults that were each making fifteen bucks an hour, forty bucks a week, that would be that'd be a, a very like probably comfortable middle class existence. Yeah. Um so yeah, I mean it's not the worst, but it's also but, yeah, very but when restric- you only have twenty four hours a week. Yeah, it's very restrictive then, for hours yeah. and thanks to the wonderful governor, there is no union. To, to speak of, I mean, the union exists, but it its power, it's anything, yeah. yeah, its power is not there in every place. Madison's better; they they do collective bargain, oh, collectively bargain. So that is that is good. Um, but I mean, the problem with that, and especially with wage work and restrictive hours, is that there's so much, so many people I know work crappy part-time jobs a lot of them don't get benefits or like the people who i work with who do get benefits that's the only reason they have those jobs like the even though it's not great health care it's health care mm-hmm. so because they need the health care and they don't have money and they need a job to pay off their debt they basically work crappy jobs till they can pay off their debt. Yeah, you know, actually this is this is taking the the conversation a little bit beyond student debt, but I feel like one thing that we're hitting on here is like the the post 2007 recession economy. Yeah. Where it really like having a bachelor's degree is not really a guarantee of anything at this point. Like there's yeah, there's lots of people that are you know, working at fast food joints or whatever, you know, like that, that have situations that, that it seems like pe- a lot of people want you to think of as just, oh, a high school or summer job. But it's like they, they've got a bachelor's degree and they've been doing it for years because they can't find anything else. And it's like that, that's a whole thing, you know, like, it especially in like you were saying reference librarians maybe they can get 15 bucks an hour but they can only get part time work it's like hmm that's that's a whole you know societal problem from many perspectives oh yeah and it's i mean and it's i i think it's exactly the way they want it because you have also then such a huge industrial reserve army as Marx would call it, that wages are severely suppressed. They can get away with things like the hours because oh, yeah. you are completely expendable. There are a thousand people waiting for any job that's somewhat decent. Yeah, exactly. To pounce up and a thousand well qualified people. Yeah, so even if you do have a 
of a good paying job or good benefits or whatever, it's all it's it's a lot easier for your employer to not really give a very good raise this year or not give much of a raise or not give a raise at all or give a raise lower than the rate of inflation or or to slowly start chipping away at your benefits or you know not no longer provide something they used to provide there's all of those kind of things that can kind of go on a little bit under the radar a little bit uh behind the scenes but it's something that I think everyone feels from one perspective or another that whether you are still in school and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do afterwards or you're not able to find the kind of job that you wanted after school or you did but seems like there's more tension or it's a little bit more precarious than than it ideally would be because of the whole economy. Like, everyone, I think, feels it a little differently from it, but it's there. And I also think this is a phenomenon more younger generations, because um, being not terribly well employed, I, uh, parents and grandparents and other people of those generations don't understand why I just don't get a better job. My grandpa has literally said, well, you like cooking. Just go to a restaurant and say you want to be a dishwasher. You'll be a cook in 10 years. And I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, that's not good. They're going to be like, yeah, we have dishwashers. Thank you. Thank you. You can't, you, know, you can't walk in and just work your way up easily anymore. You, it's, I mean, even something like a dishwasher, it's not. Yep. It, you can't do that. It, the, those opportunities no longer exist. And there's a, giant disconnect generationally with this phenomenon there is i'm sure you've seen it i hope that you have uh one of those internet memes that's like just the picture with the text on the picture Mm -hmm. and it's like old economy someone other steve or something i forget what it was but it's like a high some kids high school pick from the 70s and and then it has text over it that describes like the old like the uh, the idea of the world that your grandparents have, like, go ask someone for a job, and you get it, or whatever, like, or, like, the fact that you could work a manufacturing job in this country and be, like, instantly middle class with no high school education whatsoever, like, you can make $60,000 a year working on the, the auto parts line or whatever. And... I, I I like that because, yeah, it highlights that disconnect that so many people are feeling. Although, I'll tell you what, if you are an older person and you're retired, it's really easy to have that perspective because you don't have to necessarily deal with it. Um, not that being retired condemns you to that. You know, if you, uh, you know, understand, like, your family and work closely with those people, you can, uh, you know, come to realize all of the things that they're trying and how hard they're really working to try to, you know, make this work. Um, But if you're an older person, say like you retired early uh, and turns out you didn't make enough money or whatever and now you found out that you need to uh, go back into the labor market, I think those people understand. Like, they might not understand the plight of a young person, but they understand how tough it is. Because to be an older person trying to get a job in the economy is very difficult as well. You know, companies, a lot of them, what they want to hire is somebody young who is not expecting too much in compensation because they haven't, like, uh, grown accustomed to it yet. Someone that's close enough to college that you can... Uh, you know, that they'll be satisfied with a lower, uh, earnings, but is ambitious enough to really put in a lot of hours and, you know, do go kind of above and beyond to prove themselves or whatever. That, I think, is kind of the, the, the thing that a lot of companies are looking for right now. Um, and so I think it can be very difficult to be an older person looking for a new job at this point in time. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's even worse for older people. Now, my uh my father had been employed uh at Oscar Mayer, then bought out by Kraft for 
25 or so years, yeah. uh, 25, 26, and he was laid off because they cut his position. And thankfully, this was, I want to say 2005 or 2006, so before the crash. Oh, yeah. And, you know, out every day, doing resumes, pounding the pavement. It took him almost a year to find a new job. It was a temporary job, and it was a pay cut of, I think, more than half. Oh, and that's that was before the economy crashed. Yeah. And he's, you know, has a degree, has tons of experience, and he commands a higher price in the market for that. Yeah. And even then it was so bad. So, I mean, if the same thing would have happened to him three years later... I think he probably still would be unemployed and my parents would have had to sell their house and, you know, yeah. like it would have, it, yeah, it would have been awful. Yeah. So seeing it then, I, I really just could not imagine being an older person. I mean, you basically are SOL. I mean, you really, yeah. Yeah, it honestly, honestly, it's, it can be very scary at times to look at the economy and where it's going. And I, the, the way that so many things are going is towards automation, which is a wonderful thing from a certain perspective. Because real, like what automation should mean, you know, all of a sudden the job is replaced by a computer or a machine that can do it. What automation should mean is that we now have more leisure time or or we can use our manpower to make more things in other areas. You know, in some way we should improve our standard of living either through more leisure time or through more more services or or products for ourselves. And that is not largely in practice how it's implemented uh and I, and I think largely because of, you know, our, our economic system, because we live in a capitalist world where for an individual firm, right? Like, cause if I'm, if I'm the, a major shareholder of an individual firm and we can get rid of a whole segment of our labor force and replace them with a software program that costs a tenth of whatever the, the people cost, I'm going to go ahead and do that. But am I going to do something like, shortening the working week for all the remaining laborers? No, because that puts me at a disadvantage compared to the other firms out there. Like, I'll probably end up going out of business if I do that. But as a society, when we have everyone doing that, we're going to just end up with these vast reserves of people that are unhappy because we're not delivering to them what we really could be. You know, the older people that have been basically tossed aside, and y oh, and younger people that haven't been able to, you know, that have got a degree but are working some job. In fact, th this is, I'm going to sound a little bit like a conspiracy theorist here, <laughs> so th bear with me. Um, the... Because uh, I don't think this is like a coordinated effort, but I do feel that there's something to it, so... Um, It'll, it'll sound a little bit like it, but I think it's more just kind of like a, a collection of feelings rather than a coordinated effort. And this is what I noticed a few years ago. This was very popular. I don't know if it's continued. But the sentiment that maybe college isn't worth it seemed to be like everywhere. I'd hear it on public radio or like on, on network TV. You'd see that. And like the whole idea that maybe getting going to college and getting a degree wasn't worth it. And it was a really easy case to make because people could point to all the student debt and to and to the students not getting a job after that or at least not getting a job that they wanted after that. I actually this so this is this is this is where I'm going to sound like a conspiracy theorist. I think that that actually has more to do with the fact that we are in an economy that doesn't necessarily need a ton of super well-educated people. Like, it, the economy needs, you know, so many computer programmers and so many blah, 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 blah. So there's a need, you know, for engineers and, and designers and all that. 
but I think what people, what, what those who, uh, you know, are, are in power or get to set like the political agenda are looking at, they're seeing, oh my God, we have all of these people who have degrees and we've taught to think, um, to a certain degree. And now we can't provide for them the life that they, uh, have come to expect. And this is going to be a problem. And, uh, what we really need to do the next few years is cut down on the number of people whose expectations are so high and whose education is so high that they are like, can speak about it eloquently and, and just really kind of make sure that less of the population is looking forward to that because we're not going to be able to provide it for them. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's a, I don't think that sounds too conspiracy. I think that's just the product of the capitalist system. And yeah. I, I think even with, uh, going back to the, the, you know, the replacing people with automation, I think it's even worse than you simply fire the people. It's then you take the rest of the people and you say to them, good, now you're going to work 50 hours instead of 60 because we want you guys to get more done and you're not going to get paid anymore for doing that. And if you don't like it, we just fired a thousand people who'd love a job here. Just to clarify, you said 50 rather than 60. You went down in your example. I think you meant the opposite, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, 60 yeah. instead of 50 or 50 instead of 40 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, totally. Yeah, because after you fired those people, then you have leverage. Yeah, because it's just more industrial reserve army and the industrial reserve army suppresses wages. Yeah. And just makes things awful. And the worst yeah. part is I don't see, I don't see a clear rebound from any of this because if you look at the stock market, I just saw that the Dow passed, like, I don't even know, 1700 or something the other day, mm -hmm. which was a record high. But if you look around, I don't necessarily see that translating anywhere. It's, it's all of the gains are going up and none of it's going to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the, well, first, actually, I realize this now at this point in the conversation. We've used this term industrial reserve army a few times, oh, but I'm uh, not sure we've defined it, which would probably be good for our listeners. Some of, uh, many of you probably already know, but this is, I think a term Marx came up with, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what, where it's used? It's in capital or something? I know it's in capital. I don't know if it's earlier. My guess, I have not yet read the Gundrisa, but my guess is he probably brings it up in there. Okay. But it's just, it basically, it's just like unemployed people who are employable. Like, it's, it's the, uh, the pool that capitalists can draw upon at any time. And, and having that there, like, like we've mentioned is, is, uh, a force that can be used against those currently employed. Yeah. As much as Marx did not like talking about supply and demand, that is definitely one spot where supply and demand comes because, you know, the supply of laborers is high and the demand is low, therefore the equilibrium price for the two is low. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when you have less laborers, and I, you've brought this up in previous podcasts, um, I can't remember specifically the one, Jeez, but I don't about how. I remember. How, um, if everyone is fully employed, you have all the power over your boss because if you quit, they suddenly are without a person. So it gives you the leverage. Yep. Whereas when there's a large industrial reserve army, they have the leverage instead of you. Yeah, what's really interesting is that, like, the labor market, unlike many other markets, is, is very inelastic in its ability for supply. Like, yeah. there are this many people who want a job, and that can go sort of up or down based on how good jobs are right now. Like, maybe that has some sway over it, but pretty much, like, if you need a job to pay the bills, you need a job to pay the bills, no matter how good or bad the laboring conditions are. Like, I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's not like the same as other commodities where it's like, oh, there's a big demand for, I don't know, shoes right now. Let's just make more shoes, like, or expand, like, add another factory or whatever. Like, 
you with labor, it's not. Yeah, I guess that's the other part. Is it's one? It's not very elastic because by the time someone enters the labor force, they're probably like what at least fifteen or something. Yeah, although I wonder if that isn't getting pushed back more these days, just with the sheer amount of, you know, um, older people who are doing jobs that were more traditionally jobs for younger kids. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, you know, you go into a fast food place, how many of those people are no longer 16 and how many of those people are 26? Yeah. I mean, I, I work a, a part-time wage job. Which, I don't know how traditionally that one necessarily, sort of an odd one, uh, would be a student, like a 16-year-old. But there's nothing preventing a 16-year-old from doing my job, Mm -hmm. except that there are older people doing my job. In fact, I might, I think I'm the youngest person and I'm almost 30, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's just like, that's awesome. That's like just a indicator of where things are. Oh, yeah. And... With the student debt, too, I think the Industrial Reserve Army as well gets an extra sort of franticness for a job because with so many educated people, with so much student debt over a trillion dollars now in the United States, those people not only need a job, they need a job now because you don't get rid of your student debt. Your student debt stays with you until you die and then, depending on who you have it through, they still try and collect from your family if you die. Um, yeah. Which is I couldn't believe that when I heard... Yeah. Like, that's not a way... That's not the way... <laughs> you... I, I think there's f- something fundamentally... Um, you know, I don't like to use this term, but I'm going to use it. Evil. Something fundamentally evil about having a legal system that allows you to collect a debt from a person that had no responsibility in creating that debt. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, I I think, just straight up wrong. Well, and and for society, it will cripple us if we keep on that. Because it's already having poor effects and will have even worse effects if nothing gets done about the student debt. That if all of a sudden my children, uh, if they get saddled with all the debt I have from school, mm-hmm. if I yeah, uh, presumably well, well, accumulate it, it in the future. Yeah, it's ridiculous because, I mean, the there are, t- whenever a loan is made, there are two active parties in that loan. There's the person taking out the loan and the person giving the loan. And somehow we've decided that the person giving the loan, who actually has kind of like all the power in the situation, like Mm -hmm. presumably they have statistics about how likely it is that you'll pay them back and what the return rate will be and how much interest they need to charge to make a profit. Like they're all watching that stuff very closely. The person taking out the loan they might look at a couple of different places to take out their loan, but they don't have nearly the the research or experience advantage that the cr- creditor has, that the that the loan giver has. Yeah, it's with most contracts where the yeah, it's 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 the the hidden uh, hidden thing in the contract where I can't think of the term that Marx uses for it. Where, you know, it's, you theoretically come together as equals. Mm -hmm. I am signing a contract with you because we're equal, but it is vastly unequal. Yeah. And somehow the legal conception is that if, if the loan turns sour, in, in other words, if the person cannot pay it off before the end of their life, the government has decided, oh, that's actually entirely that, not only that person's fault, but their family's fault now. Who it's like, wait a minute. Shouldn't the creditor like have a little bit of skin in this game? Like, shouldn't they maybe be incentivized to like not give bad loans or whatever? Like, they're they're not responsible for anything somehow. This person's ch- child who 
you know, may not have been born when this decision was made is somehow responsible for it now. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's worse than that. It's they're incentivized to make bad loans because the government has proven well, that if doesn't matter, I mean, the housing crisis, I don't want to get into all that right now, but the government has proven not that I think letting all of them crash would have been the best way to go about it, um, but that if you make bad loans, the government will take care of it and give you, I mean, pump trillions of dollars at you mm -hmm. for free with no obligation. Yep. So I, they're totally incentivized to make bad loans. And these are the best kind of bad loans to make because you're guaranteed for it. I like, um, I saw Michael Hart, uh, the author and, uh, I don't know, professor, I believe, um, yeah. speaking in Madison a couple years ago. And oh, he, really? yeah, um, it was a good talk. And he referred to all of this debt, consumer debt and student debt, uh, as essentially what we've done in this country is we've now created a generation of indentured servants. Mm. Because, especially with student loan, you can't get rid of it. You have to work. And it is, I mean, 100% indentured servitude then. I mean, it's... Yeah, what, what's... It's, um... I, you know, I don't know if I want to use the term indentured servitude, but I understand why why Hart would. Michael Hart, right? Yep. Why, why, I understand why he would. But, yeah, it's it's very interesting because there's... Like, out of the surplus value that is created by an employee, there are, are all these different entities that get a cut of that, right? Yeah. So there's their employer, which is is the big one that Marx focuses on, but there's also their landlord, who, who does nothing but uh, own land. Then we're adding a third party to that. We're adding their, their student loan creditor, who now gets gets his cut of the surplus value created by an employee. So there's uh just more and more layers that we're stacking on top. Yeah, it's it's like instead of being an indentured servant to, you know, the traditional one for this country, the person paying your passage to get over to America, uh. you're an indentured servant to the capitalist uh, the American oh. capitalist system. Oh, yeah, or yeah. Yeah, actually, I I see the analogy even better now because yeah, it's the passage over to America from from the old indentured servitude, and presumably it's the passage like to having your bachelor's degree, both yeah. of which are you know both coming to America in whatever the seventeen or eighteen hundreds, or getting your bachelor's degree. Both are largely done for economic opportunity. And, you know, to make a better life for yourself and all that kind of stuff. It's the person who's who's fronted the bill for that. Yeah. 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 And especially, I mean, if we're looking at, like, these days to get a somewhat, you, know, you need a bachelor's degree to get most, a lot of jo decent jobs. Any, or at least from my experience, mm -hmm. um, because that has certainly been a bit of an issue for me in the past, or continues to be oh yeah but because especially there's so many people out there that have mm -hmm. bachelor's degrees yeah and the scary thing is it's better now i remember i don't know if you remember 2009 maybe um we were at a campfire um uh, at thad's wife's now wife's house and there were about oh yeah 12 of us there yeah and out of the 12 of us i believe Ten of us were living at home, all of us under 30, most recent college grads. Uh -huh. uh, you and one other person were actually working in the profession for which you studied for. Uh, not at that time. Oh, no, you weren't yet even at no, that time. No, I had been, but then... Yeah. Oh, that's right. Then Okay. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, almost no one was working in what they studied. Yep. Most of us weren't even employed, and... Almost none of us uh, actually had our own place to live. We were all living in, almost all of us were living in our parents' basements. Y you know what's a funny story is this podcast, the very first episode, the, the, the way back in season one where it was just me talking, 
that was when this podcast started. Oh, was, okay. Yeah, it was because I had the the extra time for being unemployed to to start a project, and the, I decided to st- start it at that time because I was not working, so I had energy to put into things. But yeah, no, it was it was an awful time. I I just needed something that I could like do and accomplish something. That was that was kind of part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Could get back to a strange labor from that. Oh, yeah, for sure. The alienation from society because you're not a laborer or something like that. Yeah. yeah well, there's nothing... Honestly, there's nothing worse than... No, well, that this isn't entirely, you know, if someone's going to bring up, like, starving in the third world, that's obviously worse. But it's an awful feeling to be an unemployed Marxist. Yeah. Because this is, this is what it means, is it means you understand the employer-employee relationship, where the employer only hires you if you will create more value than what they will pay you, See, which is the Marxist de- definition of exploitation. Uh, so you understand that you're always creating value for someone else, um, in, in excess of what you get out of it. Um, and that's all you want to do because you need to, you need to work in order to, to, to pay your bills and to like, you know, have, the, you know, a place to live and heat in your house when it gets cold outside and, I don't know, food to eat. Like, you need money to pay for those things. You need to have a job. And you're sitting there and you're like, I just want someone to come along and exploit me. I just, I will work, you know, you're filling out applications. You're, you know, reading up on this, uh, you know, place that you're applying for a job so that you can, like, speak knowledgeably about them when you go in for the interview. You know, you're rehearsing your interview questions. Like, you're putting in lots of labor into... Just the chance that someone will say, yes, I would like to hire you so I can exploit you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then all of your work, for all of your work, what you get is like a letter saying, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> if at that, I have had plenty in interview where I get nothing back even because mm. these days they don't even have to do that no 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 not and that all. is that is a sad yeah. a sad state where they don't even pretend like they appreciate you coming to beg them to exploit you. yeah right yeah. i'd be wonderful at being exploited really i can be exploited very good i'm very knowledgeable about how you want to exploit me <laughs> uh, yeah Usually not in those terms, but yeah, that's what you're thinking in your I might head try anyway. that next time, actually. <laughs> Go ahead and try. It'll be fun, but you won't get the... Don't do it on a job you want. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I would say. Oh, man. Well, I, I don't know if we reached a wrap-up point on that, but maybe we're done with this topic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the sad thing to say about it is... I mean, uh, I don't know exactly what can be done. I mean, with the way things are now, it's only going to get worse, and it'll eventually come to a head, because this is debt that can't be gotten rid of. So, it's going to come to quite the head, and I know they've sort of tried to stay off. I know Elizabeth Warren had floated a bill about reducing the interest rate on the federal loans to the actual market rate because the government is making, I don't remember how many billions of dollars a year off students, even though it's economically beneficial to the United States to be providing education, especially higher education to everyone. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's being run as a capitalist enterprise Mm -hmm. instead of... To make money off of student loans. Yeah, Yeah. instead of... like. The fact that that person has like a well-paying job is going to give you more income tax and more sales yeah. tax, like more everything tax, essentially. Yeah, it's one of those things I don't understand other than the people who just want the government out of everything. I do not understand the right wing's opposition beyond that because it's easily provable that investment in higher education and education and making it cheaper for people creates... Uh, higher GDP, more government revenues. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's 
unquestionably beneficial to society. Like, there isn't, it's not like, a, oh, well, the, it's, it's, it can be shown. So Th- the fact is- that people just don't, I don't understand that. This is where I go back to what I was saying earlier, where there was all of this talk about, well, maybe it's not a good idea to go to college. I think it's because employers, so the, the, cause the right wing is actually really interesting politically. I think about this more and more, where they are, the, really there's an amalgamation there, right? Because employers is not a large enough group to make a political party. Right. So, so there's employers, and they're, they, I think hold a lot of clout within the right wing, but they're not entirely all of it. But what they don't want is a bunch of employees that are overeducated and uh, expect more than what they're willing to give. So that's their interest in not investing in education. And then I think the, the, there's, you know, the, the other part of the right wing, I think, is a little bit harder to analyze, or at least I often find it harder to analyze. But I think there's also this part of it that people know, people on the right know that um, the more education a person has, they tend to be more towards the left then. And I think that can be threatening for the right. So they think, well, let, let's not let this education thing get out of hand because then everyone's going to, you know, join the other camp. So I think there's, there's a certain amount of incentive there. I think there's also a kind of, uh, and actually I, th- I think there's a certain level that uh, I agree with this thought. If you're a working class person and so, and your taxes are going towards funding higher level education. You're essentially paying the way for your boss and your future. And by boss here, I mean like mid-level boss, like your, your, your manager and your future managers. You're basically paying their way through school. Like if you're a working class person, you probably don't make as much as someone that goes through college, but you're paying for their way through college, which I think I, I, I recognize that as something that can be a little bit problematic. Um, you know, so I, I think there's a certain, uh, issue there that I think the left tends to ignore. And I, I don't have an answer for it. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, the left likes to, particularly when it comes to how the right deals with education or educated people. I think the left really likes to talk about the right-wing demonization of what they call elites and, oh, look, they're educated. What do they know? You know, Mm -hmm. but, and uh, particularly with um, creationism, uh, anti-vaccination stuff. Um, However, the left, I think as much as they like to point that out, and maybe the reason they ignore those other things is because they want to focus on this, because I think they see it in themselves a little bit, too. Like, a lot of the anti-vaccination stuff is not a right-wing thing. It's oh, yeah. a left-wing thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a left-wing... Because you... I mean, the left and the right blend in sort of weird ways, but, you know, it comes out of the... Um, more holistic medicine stuff and, you know, let's be good for the environment. And then it's, oh, well, what are they putting into me? And I mean, people are absolutely right, I think, to be distrustful of pharmaceutical companies, mm-hmm. but probably not right in any way, shape, or form to be distrustful of something like a vaccine that provably helps people significantly. Um, yeah. But I wonder if if that's the one they focus on because they sort of see it reflected in themselves a little bit and are trying to call the other side out on it so that they don't, you know, it doesn't get cast back at them. Oh, I don't know. I don't know either. I, yeah. I just know that it's, yeah, it's weird and all that stuff gets complicated when you start to get out to the the not very straight up and down obvious who hates what and why and yeah especially with something like education i think it 
it, it is very interesting to me to find, to pick apart political parties or political groupings to see kind of what makes them up. Yeah. Because I, one thing that, one of, the, one of the best things that ever, maybe this is just a coincidence, but for me, it came out of the Tea Party. Maybe it just happened at the same time as the Tea Party. But I finally realized that the right in the United States, like the Republican Party in the United States, is not just one block of people that all think the same way. But that, uh, I realized that there were these factions and that they really care about very different things. And sometimes, you know, the, it's the alliance between them is much more precarious than what an outsider like me r- realizes. Well, and I think I, 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 I agree with you and I have that same experience. I think part of that comes out of when we're growing or our generation in that, you know, when I think when I was 18 is when George uh, w. Bush was elected, and you know that's uh, somewhere around. It's maybe the been... second time he was elected. Wait, oh no, I don't know. It's no, maybe the second time. But I mean, more uh, when I, I be- know, started to become more politically conscious is under him, essentially. I think he won the two thousand election. Was Did his he? first okay. election, and then two thousand. Right, then that was the second. Was one. the second one? Yeah. Okay. Well, under him is when I started to be more politically conscious, you know, starting to get a little older. And under the Bush-Cheney White House, Uh I think they were awful, terrible people, but they did a phenomenal job, I think, of creating a right-wing hegemonic... um, Oh, like to get everyone on the same page. Yeah, the right-wing hegemony, if I can say that word. Uh Right when hegemony was very strong and it was very clear cut, particularly after September 11th. Yeah. They really codified and, I mean, people were understandably scared and frightened. So everybody was happy to line up with their ducks in a row behind that. And I think that hid a lot of these distinctions that were there. So I think for younger people, um, it's, yeah, it's now that we're going, oh, well, okay, the right wing isn't exactly the same. Yeah. Like, why is it that the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street both go, yeah, why did we build the banks? Yeah. You know, that's, uh-huh. it's, it's weird, not that it makes things in Washington work any better, because Washington just doesn't work well <laughs> these days. <laughs> But it's, yeah, I, I think that's where that comes out of, is just under such a, I won't call it George W. Bush a strong leader, but I think his administration held an unusual amount of ideological sway on the right. Yeah. Well, I agree. I also wonder if we shouldn't mention that, uh, I know the, uh, the DSA nationally has their drop student debt campaign. Oh yeah, which is a wonderful answer to student debt, and that is to get rid of it all. It is makes it like perf- a debt forgiveness program, or how's it work? <sighs> I don't know the details of it. Okay, I shouldn't have brought it up. Okay. I don't know the details. Oh, well, you got the name in there. That's the plug for the name. Yeah, um, I believe. Yeah, it's just a. It's dropping students' debt. I don't remember if it's after they work for so many years to pay it back. But I wouldn't, I don't think you actually would need to since we've already pumped trillions of dollars into the banks. They don't need that money. All right. Uh, you know, speaking of, um, actually the, the, the bailout and, and banks and student debt and things like that, this got me very, I was thinking about this earlier this week. There was, um, I was listening to one of the local public radio shows and they had a little call in about, um, I think it was President Obama pushing for paid sick leave and some other stuff, uh, for employers. I think maybe family medical leave, like paid maternity leave sort of thing. Um, and they, they had like their two guests on to represent both sides of the issue. And the, the guy on the right wing side, um, he his approach to the issue was this is a great idea but no one is talking about who's going to pay for this and how it's go- how we are going to afford it and honestly i 
think that that's one of the problems with the left is, and by left here, I mean like the near left, like the Democrats, the Democrats. <laughs> and, and, uh, Obama and, and just, I don't know, other people like friends of mine that call themselves liberals, um, they, they don't often think about who's going to pay for this. And I think it's because it's harder to make the argument when you're arguing that. Like, it's really easy argument when, like, theor- when you don't have to address that question. But the awful part about that is, is it makes the right wing look really kind of smart and them kind of dumb. Like, when, when you don't have an answer to that, it's sort of like, you're not really being an adult about this. Like, you, that's a question that you need to think about and need to have an answer for. But the, I will point out this, that the right wing has been very good at using, at pointing that out when they need to point it out for their own purposes, but no one ever said that about the bank bailout, and no one ever says it about, you know, all sorts of money that's spent on things that the right wing supports. Iraq, Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe it gets brought up every once in a while, like especially for wars. Yeah, I think you're right, but you know, like uh, you know, the tax holidays. You can use it for all sorts of things. I feel like the left wing could really pick up that argument and use it when they need to. Yeah, and it's I, I think part of the problem too with that though is that the right wing has done with the the neoliberalism under neoliberalism has it has been so effective that you can't get uh really anyone any politician to say well we just need to tax more oh, the yeah. idea of increasing taxes on anyone for any reason is just not Hap- like people can't even bring it up anymore, mm-hmm. even though that's the obvious way. Since the top tax rate is laughable, yeah. Um, and Compared to what we used to have historically, yeah. especially, yeah, yeah. And it's so with them effectively blocking that off. And I mean, then the other thing is, well, take it out of the Department of Defense's budget. You know, why do they need so much for a black budget? What are they buying anyway that costs that much? And then suddenly it's a you love terrorist. You know, yeah. it's, yeah, they've, I think part of the problem with that is, yeah, that the right has really just cut off the options for funding things. I mean, it's just, and, and they've mm-hmm. done so well at showing, or defunding government things so that they can say, oh, look, government doesn't work because we haven't funded it, but we'll ignore that part and just show you that government doesn't work, so why should we ever pay for government? Yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Cut the budget until it's so low nobody can do their job, and then say, well, this doesn't work very well. (laughs) Say, see, I told you. You know, that's, yeah. Yeah. It's a good game. It's a good game they got figured out. They, they know what they're doing. Yeah, unfortunately. They do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think that that's a good wrap up for student debt. That wasn't a wrap up at all. No. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.